Hello, welcome to today's edition of Pegasus Test. On today's edition, we're talking about field phones. In the modern 21st century, field phones seem rather antiquated, but they are still very viable and much underappreciated pieces of gear. Why would that be? Well, they're usually sound powered in most cases, or at the very most powered by a pair of D-cell batteries. And right there, you have a common power source and you have a cheap power source, or in some cases with the sound power, no power source at all. So your logistical uh, line just got easier. You're not worried about charging ports. Does this uh, USB uh, compatible with that USB? Because they're all different, even though it's a universal service bus. Um, also, uh, they are not prone to jamming. You cannot jam field phones. The only way to take them out of service as the enemy is to cut the wire. Now, yes, that can be done, and it has been done, and I'll put a link at the end of this video uh, to a One Shepherd exercise where my field phone lines were constantly getting cut. But that also worked against the enemy, because when my lines were cut, I knew the enemy was in the area and approximately where they were. And I could A, avoid them, or B, attack them at will. So it was a double-edged sword. Unlike a radio, which you have to go through a series of troubleshooting features to figure out why you're not establishing contact, with a field phone, it's super easy. Are the wires connected? Did I put the batteries in? And if you can say yes to both of those, then it's either the other guy didn't connect it properly or put his batteries in, or it got cut somewhere in the middle. That's it. That's your whole list of troubleshooting for field phones. And when you, and that's your whole list, figuring out what the problem is is real quick. Because you can go, huh, phone connected properly, batteries are in if, it, if it's a phone using batteries and if it's a, a sound powered phone you don't even have the battery equation so it's either hey my patrol that took this out to the LPOP didn't connect it correctly which they'll do their troubleshooting and correct self-correct if they're having the same problem and not connecting or both sides go hey we've connected this properly and the wire's been cut and if we know the wire's been cut there's enemy between us and our main body or we just simply got it caught on something and we have to go out and repair it. Either way, you, you figured out what's wrong with it almost instantly if it's not working. Let's take a look at a few available uh, field phones. Do not take this as a comprehensive list. This is more just ones I have access to. There's many types out there, but in principle they all work exactly the same way. Right here we have the TA1. This is my favorite field phone. Uh, reason it's my favorite field phone, no batteries. It is a sound powered phone system. Uh, you just crack, crack it and then uh, talk and they can hear you. You don't need any batteries. And not having batteries as part of my fighting load is absolutely awesome. If you look at the modern fighting man and look at his fighting load, you'll be surprised at the significant portion of his weight that's taken up by batteries for his radios, his nods, and all the other electronics he's required to carry. Uh, any chance to offload a battery is a good thing in my book. Now, the TA-1 consists of the carrying strap in the case and the actual TA-1 itself. I'm pull it out. And if this looks familiar, it's probable because this is the same phone that Commander Adama used in Battlestar Galactica to talk to his ships. However, enough sci-fi geekery. Let's take a look at the TA-1 and its natural habitat. And here's a good view of the TA-1 and its natural habitat. We have a position here overlooking a road juncture, and we, this is a lookout LPOP position. So the phone is positioned. You notice the carrying strap here has been run around the tree. That's so the phone will stay connected to the tree in the middle of the night. If somebody comes along to relieve this LPOP, or an enemy patrol is trying to sneak through, and catches the wire, and that's going to stop the phone from being dragged away. Also. I'm going to get a close-up here of something very important. So very important is how this phone is connected. You'll notice here that the only enough wire to connect to the system has been uh, stripped off. The rest of it's been left on. That's very important. That helps keep the connections dry and it also keeps interference out, which can be a reason the line doesn't work sometimes. The next important thing is right here where it says caution 100 volts. No lie. You know, don't crank this thing and have a live exposed wire touching your buddy because he's not going to be your buddy after that. He is not going to appreciate that. On the other hand, you know, if the enemy's got a hold of it, eh, he deserves it. 
but be aware of that. This is 100 volts going through there and you can hurt somebody. Next important item is placement of your phone. Notice that the case is contoured and that matches this contour right here on the phone and that's for ease of travel. So when you pack it up, you wanna do like that because it gives enough room to get the cord back into the case and then you can seal the lid and keep it waterproof. When you're in a field like this, turn it around so it's like that sticking up. That'll serve two functions. One, when it goes off, it's easy to grab. Second thing, inside the case, it'll echo a little bit. These cases are plastic, so any little sound that hits them is amplified a little bit. Um, you might think that's a tactical disadvantage, but I've never encountered anybody that says, oh, I heard your TA-1 case. So it's not that big a deal. Now let's see what happens when this LPOP receives a call. Now that's with the volume at maximum. And that alerts the person at that LPOP that the call is coming in and that the person at the other end of the line wants to speak to them. Now should you be so close to the enemy that that clacking sound is a danger to you, you have this. This is a bioluminescent glow-in-the-dark disc and that will light up when you get called. So all you have to do to make that go away is just talk back to the person. You see that glowing? That means somebody tried to talk to you. You answer them back and it goes away. Let's go ahead and turn the sound all the way off so you can get a demonstration of how that works. And there you have it. That's how it looks with the sound off. You still have a visual indicator that you're making a call. And all you have to do to make that go away is just respond. The response makes it go away. Now let's go over the controls of the TA-1. The controls of the TA-1 are very simple. You have this button right here. It's the call button. On the other side, the small button is your push to talk. That's all you do. Call. And then push to talk. Now, one of the things to remember, big button is call, little button is talk. And that's easy to forget. And if you're on the other end of this and somebody signals you and then you get on the phone and go, go ahead LPOP, and then they start going like this and talking to you, the only thing that's heard is the clack. They don't hear that you're saying, hey, I've got 15 enemies sneaking up on me. They don't hear that. You've got a signal. Once they acknowledge, you hit the little button to talk. Now let's assume our little OPOP here has done its job. They have watched this high speed avenue of approach and they see the vanguard of an enemy unit coming and they realize their position is untenable. It's just two guys against a platoon in this case. What do they do? Well, they hit the thing, wait for the call, LP1, LP1 to main body, enemy force and route, position untenable, leaving now. And all they have to do then, undisconnect, and that by telling the enemy or telling the main body that they're leaving, that tells the main body to collect the cable. They can start reeling it in, and we'll cover that later in this video. And then the next thing they do, said carrying case from the tree. And off they go. All right, the next step up from a TA-1 is the TA-43. Um, I had a great sci-fi reference for the TA-1. I don't have one for the TA-43, but you have seen it on TV before. For those of you a fan of the TV show MASH, this is what Radar used whenever he had to talk to Sparky. He would just walk up. Grab the little handle here, spin it up, and he'd be talking to Sparky at i -Corps. And sometimes he got Colonel Potter all the way to the Pentagon on this phone. And that's maybe an exaggeration, but the truth is, no, it's not actually. This phone is really powerful. It is battery powered and you need two D-cell batteries. And they go in this battery compartment right here in the center of the phone. And the crank, unlike the TA-1, which was used to power up that system, uh, this crank is just a call device. So it makes the phone at the other end ring. Could, uh, could uh, Radar talk to the Pentagon with a TA-43? The answer is yes, he can. 
Uh, it, it has to go through a lot. It goes through a switchboard called a GRA39. It goes to other switchboards, other switchboards into a phone system. So it could be done with this phone. Uh, in the field, that's very impractical. The use of a phone like this is for powering a hot loop. In the case of our uh, fictional LPOP we had in the prior segment, uh, the, bay, uh, the patrol base where the main body's at, that's where this would be. And they would power up the system, which makes gives the system power for the TA-1s to work better than they do on their own. Not that the TA-1s work bad on their own, but this makes them better. The features of the phone are not that different than the TA-1. You have a battery compartment. You connect the wires down here in the exact same way you connected them to the TA-1. On the side, you have this handle here pulls out and that powers up the system and alerts the phone on the other end. And then you follow the same procedures. You wait for the phone on the other end to respond and then you send your message traffic. Now be aware, if you're operating this on a hot loop, and we did this uh, during one of the area defense FTXs at One Shepherd, the headquarters at the patrol base or the defensive position had this and each of the fighting positions had a TA-1. The headquarters would power up, all the fighting positions would answer in, and then headquarters would say, Charlie team, be prepared to send out relief to the LPOP, or whatever the message traffic was. A lot of times, this would be used for, say, fighting position one calls back to the headquarters saying they got movement to their front. Um, that's a low-powered message because the TA-1 system, the headquarters would then power up the line and pass it on to all the fighting positions that, hey, there's enemy to our front. It's a super versatile phone system. What are its downsides? Now we have batteries. And you know at the beginning of this video, I'm not a fan of having lots of different batteries. But this uses D-cell batteries. That's a great thing because you can get D-cells anywhere. You know, all of a sudden Walmart just became a main supply point for you. Or on your way out to your training area and you realize, damn it, forgot batteries, the gas station you stop at is probably going to have D-cell batteries and it only requires two. They last forever. I literally cannot uh, recall any experience of these sound-powered phones that use batteries running out of juice in the field. Now, I have to admit my TA-43 experience is uh, limited because this is literally a 1950s Korean Air War era phone. So it's been superseded by the TA-312, which has since been super, super, superseded by the, the 1032. I might be getting that nomenclature wrong, but be that as it may, still an incredibly viable phone system, and it's a great addition to have for your tactical field communications. Drawback to this phone system here, because it's battery powered, if you do encounter the situation where your batteries go dead and your TA-1s are calling into you, you're not going to know. I've taken the batteries out, I'm powering the TA-1, it doesn't work on the TA-312. That's the responsibility of this operator to make sure his batteries are up. As I said earlier, I've never encountered a situation where the batteries go dead. I don't think you'll have to you'll encounter it, but it is a possibility. Here's the final field, field phone I have access to. And this is the German equivalent of the TA-43 I just demonstrated. Uh, it is also the equivalent basically in function of the US TA-312 and the TA-312 TA successor. It is D-cell battery powered and it's designed to perform the functions that I just outlined that the previous TA-43 did. You have a phone on the uh, phone, you have a way to call, and you have a way to talk. Inside here, the cover is Bakelite, so you can tell this is 1950s, 1960s technology. And you have a battery compartment, you have your connections for the wire, and then you have all these diagram in German and these wires and adapters that tell how to connect this to a very large phone system. And uh, I have no idea how to do that, and I have no idea to speak how to speak German, because apparently being a fan of Ramstein doesn't automatically teach you German. I'll have to work on that. However, I have found in Germany, Ein Bier Bitte is about all the German I need to know. <laughs> they have two little cuts on the front of the case here, and as you can see, one has the phone wire coming out, the other ha allows the uh, wires to the other phone system to come in, which allows the cover to be closed and the phone to drop, close up, and it makes it all nice and waterproof. And your phone just hangs out here on this nice little hook on the strap, waiting for your call to come in or for you to call whoever needs to get information. 
I pointed out this German system because they are plentiful out there on the surplus market. Uh, I do see them come up time to time in various surplus magazines. I got these about 12-15 years ago when my son was in Cub Scouts and they were used to great effect much the way their intended purpose was. In the Cub Scouts we used them in the rocketry. Uh, we'd have a launch team and we'd have a tracking team and we'd have a mission control team and we'd set up a series of these phones, create a hot loop and the mission control would tell the different kids what to do, when to launch the rocket, and then the, the uh, tracking team would tell how high the rocket went, and it would tell the recovery teams to go pick the rocket up, all on a very small scale compared to what NASA does, but the concept's the same. The hot loop concept is the same you would use in the field at your patrol base or your defensive position, and these phones performed greatly. So we've talked a lot about field phones. No talk about field phones is gonna be complete without this, field phone communication wire com wire as it were. This is a spool. I think it's got about 400 to 600 meters on it. I don't remember exactly. Um, I think about four. I guess that's not really the point to a certain extent. Um, this is your key to your system. The phones by themselves do nothing unless they're connected to wire. And you gotta have wire. Now this is the US military DR8 roll with the RG30 something or other handle, spool, uh, handle and carry strap system. And this is how most of your wire is dispensed out in the field. The situation where I had the LPO, LPOP pulling out and he packed up his phone and left the wire, back at the patrol base or the main defensive position, as soon as that's given, the person on this wire grabs this reel and just starts cranking like they've just caught the biggest fish of their life to get that wire back in. Because with that wire laying out there, that is a basic handrail for the enemy to find your position. Now if you're in a defensive position and they're moving on you in force, they probably know where you're at, but why make it easier than it has to be? Carrying this thing is not light. My first one, Shepard FTX, not going to lie, this thing kicked my butt. But that being said, it's a very necessary thing. I've never done an FTX since then without one. Uh, when I was on active duty and in the National Guard, always used these things. Uh, and they were always handy. They always came to the field with us. A lot of people didn't appreciate them, but those who did knew how to use them and swore by them. You can use speaker wire in, a, in place of military comm wire. Uh, the spool like this that I bought for myself personally sent me back about $50 with the uh, spindle system. I, from what I've seen price-wise, that's generally about average, sometimes a little more. If you're willing to accept a degraded condition, you can get it a little less. If you're bought, willing to buy the spool without the spindle system, you can save even more money, although the money you spend on the spindle is highly worth it, in my opinion. As a uh, stand-in for this wire, you can use common speaker wire that you would find at any hardware store, electronics store. It'll work just as well. And sometimes you might even uh, feel that the um, different color of the speaker wire might be an advantage. If you look at the current environment we're in, it's going from winter into early spring. It's still a lot of tans and browns in the environment. And a lot of that commercial speaker wire will be brown, copper colored, tan colored, and may actually blend in a little bit better than the black wire here. We hope you found this review of Field Phones helpful and informative. Please comment, like, and subscribe, and tune in for future videos on field communications.